Good morning, everyone. Um, wherever you are across this uh, great continent of ours. Um, my name is Ken Coates. I'm a senior fellow with the McDonald Lurie Institute. And welcome to our webinar, Building Across Borders, Energy, Infrastructure, the Environment, and Canada-U.S. Relations in the Biden Era. The McDonald Lurie Institute, as many of you will know, is a think tank based, national think tank based in Ottawa. Have a long-standing interest in Canadian-American relations. It's been a major theme of, of the Institute for, for its, its entire existence. Uh, our goal in this seminar and, and, and also other activities is to bring together the top thinkers, in this case in Canada and the United States, uh, to address issues of critical national importance. And not very many things stand up as important as infrastructure, energy, and the environment, and particularly the transition that's underway in the United States. I'm delighted to bring here today five presenters, four of them in person and one of them on tape. Uh, this topic is a really critical one. Canada-U.S. relations are always vital, sometimes a little bit more important in, in, in the public mind in Canada than they are in the United States. But what's going on, of course, with the election of, and the appointment of or uh, uh, coming into office of, of President Joe Biden um, is the change the administration has raised hopes and fears. Uh, the hopes are based based largely in Canada's ter terms on a, a shared, generally a shared progressive uh, agenda, particularly in the issues of climate change, but also some fears, fears of uh, related to the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline and protection, potential protectionist measures uh, uh, in the United States. So that's what we're going to discuss today. It's a very lively group. We've got a fabulous group of, of colleagues and presenters. Um, we're going to start with opening uh, remarks from our other panelists. Of the five panelists we have, um, the first one, as I mentioned, by videotape. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to have a moderated question and answer period for about uh, 30 minutes. Um, uh, the questions have been assembled by, from, by the McDonald Lurie Institute and drawn from input from many of the attendees. So if you've, we thank you very much for the questions you've sort of posed to us already. We will take questions during the, the, the webinar itself. So as the conversation is going along, if you just write into the chat function the questions that you have, we're going to curate those as we go along and we'll add them into the conversation sort of uh, down the line. Um, won't be able to have a chance to get to everything, I'm sure, but it'll certainly start us off in a, in a sort of a good way. So what I'm going to do to start off is introduce Jack Mintz. Uh, Jack Mintz is one of Canada's most distinguished uh, political economists. Um, he's a, a, a senior fellow at McDonald Lurie Institute. He's also associated with the Policy School um, at the University of Calgary. And he's uh, tape recorded his, his presentation for us today. So I'm happy to introduce Jack Mintz. Thank you very much, uh, Ken, for the introduction. Uh, I've uh, been tasked to ask uh, uh, some questions about Keystone and what it means for Canada specifically. And what I'd like to do is really first start off with uh, talking about the implications of Keystone, uh, what it means in terms of what we're doing as a country, why it's important, and then uh, go through uh, what I think are, are, are critical issues about how we should go uh, forward uh, after this uh, particular um, serious issue that uh, I think has has happened when um, when the Biden administration had cancelled the presidential permit uh, for the construction of, of Keystone XL. Uh, let me first of all begin uh, that the reason why Keystone XL was was very important to the industry was not just because it provided greater pipeline capacity for moving oil down, uh, but also it gave the best net backs. In other words, if you look at the price at which oil trades at in, in the Gulf Coast of the United States, and you subtract off transportation costs, quality differences between heavy oil, which is bitumen, and light oil, which is at the WTI price, uh, as well as uh, the cost of diluent to move the oil down to you, to the U.S., that is still a better option in terms of the return to Canada and GDP uh, than any other uh, potential pipeline project that many people talk about, whether it's Energy East or 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 taking uh, oil down by train uh, down to the Gulf Coast. So that's one reason why canceling XL was really a, a serious issue for Canada because we were going to be hurt by it. Uh, we were hurt in terms of uh, the amount of income that Canadians would get 
uh, out of the project relative to other things. Also, we have to remember that cancellation of Excel will at times lead to uh, uh, some severe uh, problems with pipeline capacities when a particular pipeline is down and all of a sudden the industry finds that it cannot ship its oil easily unless it uh, ships it by train, which is more costly uh, to do, as well as having higher environmental impacts, uh, then, uh, then we are going to have a situation where the price of oil in Alberta is going to be discounted more heavily uh, relative to the, the Gulf Coast. And of course, that means, again, uh, less profits, uh, but, but it is a very serious issue in terms of lower taxes uh, for federal and provincial governments, uh, as well as losing export revenues, which would have an impact on uh, Canada's uh, exchange rate to, to a certain extent. And then finally, uh, the cancellation of Keystone, which was frankly done uh, really uh, by, by Biden at a time when he didn't even listen to what potentially could have been uh, uh, recognized as, as, as a very good pipeline project because of its use of uh, renewable power uh, to to uh, use it, to run it so to be an electric uh, source of electricity uh, for uh, for for the pipeline, uh, but also the tangible benefits to First Nations that we're going to get a return on that, plus the tax revenues that we're we're going to be given. Uh, but it but it also steals more opposition, and we're already hearing. Um, opposition to the South Dakota plant, uh, pipeline, which is important to the U.S. Uh, Bakken area. Uh, it's uh, clearly potentially could lead to problems with Line 5, uh, which is the one running through Michigan, uh, which is oil is very important to Quebec and Ontario because if the oil does not get to into Ontario and Quebec, uh, there will be much higher gasoline and diesel prices as a result. Uh, and then finally, uh, there, it's even stirring up uh, the pot in uh, for line three, which is the one going through Minnesota, uh, all on the pretense that, well, we've now canceled Keystone. This is what the argument being made by the left in the United States is now that we've canceled Keystone, uh, well, we should also be canceling these other projects that carry oil sand uh, bitumen to, to, the rest, uh, to the rest of the United States, uh, even though it's, it has very dramatic impacts on, on Canada. Uh, so this is actually a very serious issue, and it needs to be dealt with. Uh, and 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 I don't think Canada can stand by uh, by 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 this at all. And so uh, there are three different approaches that I think can be done from a policy perspective. Uh, the first one, which gets criticism, but frankly, I don't think it's it's appropriate. Yes, there is things that we could do on a retaliatory basis on in the short term, uh, but we'd like to do it in such a way that we're not cutting off our nose to spite her face. And so I don't think putting tariffs on oil-based products coming from the United States into Canada is, is really the best approach. On the other hand, there are things we want to do that I think are quite sensible from a Canadian perspective. And that was, for example, what I mentioned in my article in Keystone, uh, is going after digital services. There are several issues involved, uh, a couple of them on the tax side, including uh, potentially following the French with a uh, a, 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 a tax on digital revenues as a surrogate for the corporate income tax, unless there's a deal made at the international level, one could move ahead with that now and just say, this is because of the decision made by the Biden administration, that this will be our retaliation. And, and, it, and it makes sense. There's no reason not to do that. Uh, or we could carry out what uh, the King government is already talking about. And that is to provide a fair deal to uh, newspapers and other news media in Canada uh, where they would get paid for the copyright by uh, by the major platforms that are using their information uh, as Australia is doing and that certainly is something that one could say well we're now going to move ahead because of the way that you're treating us on our most important export coming out of Canada which is mineral fuel which is more even more important uh, than, than the auto trade now, of course, uh, retaliation, I think, is, is, a, is really just a short run way of saying we, we need a better deal. And, and so another option, which I think uh, would make a lot of sense, uh, is to 
develop uh, uh, or at least try to get the Biden administration to agree to some sort of energy pact. And, and that energy pact would be something that would not, not only take into account oil uh, and construction of, uh, of uh, pipelines in North America as a whole and, and the use of uh, whatever oil that we are going to need over the next several decades, uh, but also uh, the, the carbon issues, uh, including what I think could be a, a, a very significant issue coming down the road, which are carbon border adjustments. And in fact, even that could be a retaliation for Canada. We could say that the United States, since it doesn't have a carbon tax um, or a cap and trade system except for a few states, uh, we could actually make the decision that we're going to put a carbon border adjustment on manufactured goods coming from the United States because they're not being as tough on carbon as we are. Uh, that's actually a very interesting thing to consider. Uh, but I would rather see that, that uh, as, uh, as one in which we try to coordinate rather than create a huge amount of uh, dislocation and economic costs associated with very bad decision making. So that could be a, a, a second alternative. The, the difficulty is, is this really going to be something that we can get uh, a good deal for Canada if we try to get into an energy pact or whether we would be better uh, looking at other alternatives, which really gets to the third uh, type of, uh, uh, of policy reaction that we could have in Canada. And that is to say we have this huge resource uh, in, in the ground, uh, our oil and gas uh, supplies. Uh, we can sell LNG in terms of uh, natural gas to the rest of the world. We can sell oil to the rest of the world. But right now, over 90% of our oil and gas goes down to the United States. And maybe we really do need to develop some other uh, alternatives uh, in order to give us not only uh, uh, diversification in, in other markets uh, that could reduce risks, but also improve the uh, the the negotiation uh, hand that we have vis-a-vis the United States. And, and so a third option is, is to uh, try to look at alternatives uh, that would give us uh, other markets uh, besides the United States. Uh, and that some people have talked about reviving Energy East. I'm not sure that's even possible. Uh, but certainly there have been some serious interests in maybe using Churchill uh, and Hudson Bay as potentially an outlet for 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 exporting oil. Uh, there's been other uh, other options that have been including uh, going to British Columbia, but we would have to uh, change some regulations that would allow that. Particularly uh, the tanker ban that uh, was brought in uh, by the Liberal government uh, would have to relent on that if it was if safety was uh, was ensured. And, and and we could also, there's been discussions about uh, rail transportation to Alaska, but of course that will require American uh, cooperation uh, as well to a certain extent. So uh, I think that uh, those options are, are hard, but I should remind you that none of them probably would have uh, necessarily the same best rates of return that we could get on various projects as Keystone XL. But if, now that Keystone XL is dead, I think we have to think of whatever policy alternatives uh, that we can have uh, for the future. Well, when you invite Jack Mintz to uh, present something at a webinar, you get informed and provocative ideas, and Jack is not disappointed in the slightest in this instance. I'm going to ask each of our other four uh, panelists to give you introductory comments, a fairly brief introductory comments, before we go back to a, um, an ongoing conversation. I'd like to start and, and introduce Gary Dewar. Uh, Gary Dewar is one of Canada's most distinguished diplomats, had a very successful time as Canadian ambassador to Washington from 2009-2016. Uh, very successful premier of the province of Manitoba, his beloved province of Manitoba for, for 10 years. And he remains very actively involved with trade issues in the United States. Uh, Gary, your introductory comments, please. Well, thank you, Ken, and thanks to the Donald Laurie Institute for inviting me to be a part of this great panel. Uh, I just want to start by saying that in terms of Canada-U.S. relations, uh, we should start with why did Joe Biden get elected president? What, what does it mean for Canada? Uh, his number one priority during the election campaign was the pandemic. He campaigned on a more effective response to the pandemic. He campaigned on a more effective uh, 
way of dealing with it, of getting a patriotic response to managing the pandemic and lowering the numbers and eventually eliminating the disease in the United States. And uh, he is reinforcing that uh, uh, priority with a visit this week to Wisconsin and, and Michigan uh, to reinforce his priority. It's also the priority in Canada. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau will get a mandate or not get a mandate on his perceived uh, work on the pandemic here in Canada. So they're both together on the pandemic. I would suggest in the short term, we can cooperate in the knowledge economy uh, by having cooperation on working on the sequencing of viruses, this one and others, uh, as we have in the past with Ebola, uh, with his, Joe Biden's uh, chief of staff, former chief of staff, uh, Ron Klain, who's working in the White House. We worked uh, together, and I think we have to work in the future together on uh, challenges to uh, our health care. Number two, of course, is the economy. There's been a lot of coverage on Buy America. I would say that in the past, when Joe Biden was the vice president, we were able to work with the hard hats in the United States that he's close to, and the steel workers union on both sides of the border, or the machinists, or the building trades, to have a, a negotiated waiver for Canada. We were the only country to get a waiver under the Recovery Act in 2009-10. And I hope that we can again use those great contacts across the border uh, to protect Canada's supply chains with the United States, with the Biden administration. And finally, uh, both countries are pledged to implement the Paris Accord. I would like to see the discussion on climate uh, tied with energy. I believe sustainability, cleaner air is also tied to reliability of clean energy across the border whether it's hydro or oil or gas, uh, we can benefit by having one table dealing with, every, with all the items, not just have project by project uh, kind of reward or disappointment uh, based on episodic evidence. So that's where I see the opportunities, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. That's wonderful. Um, I really like the fact that you highlight the continued importance of union power. We, we, we forget the authority and the, the moral authority, but also the practical value of unions in a lot of our, our cross-border and even our domestic sort of considerations. And I like the fact that you snuck in some good old discussion of Manitoba Hydro into the, into the conversation. We focus on oil and gas, but of course hydro, we'll come back to this I hope a little later on, hydro is a very important trans-border energy source and it's already been a big one. It could be a much larger one. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Appreciate that. I'd like now to introduce uh, Lisa Rayet, um, uh, one of Canada's most formidable politicians, a former politician, I guess, from Ontario. Former. <laughs> yeah, former, <laughs> former. <laughs> um, but as a member of parliament, she was a minister of transport, but a minute had other portfolios in the, the Harper government, was a deputy leader of the opposition. Uh, often touted as a leadership candidate, but I won't mention that today. Um, and now she's the Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking at CIBC. Lisa, delighted to have you with us today, and I welcome your opening comments. Thanks very much, Ken. I'm going to build off of what Gary and you were just talking about, which is Gary has set out very well the what part of what is going to be the crux of the Canada-US relationship, what we should watch for going forward. And I thought I'd just give an insight into the who part. Um, I was very lucky to be part of the administration that worked in the first term with President Obama and Vice President Joe Biden as he then was. And I can tell you from what I saw is that the what gets done by the who who's on the ground. And to put it very bluntly, there is a lot of people that need to be working in sync in order to keep the relationship uh, not only in good standing, but moving forward, which is certainly what we want to have happen in the next four and a, four years. Uh, so who are the people who are important in terms of keeping it all going? First and foremost, you have to look to the officials within the departments that have already really good relationships across the border. In the past four years, I don't know what's happened to a lot of those frameworks that have been put in place with either the clean energy dialogue or with the beyond the borders because it was a different administration to deal with but certainly these kinds of connections are still in place people know who to pick up the phone to call on the other side and i would expect and anticipate that in ottawa that a lot of officials are rekindling the relationships that they had in the past and looking to actually just meet up again with the folks that they worked with on important issues to both Canada and the US. And I'm not talking about only within Global Affairs Canada, I'm talking within Transport Canada, 
within Environment Canada, Natural Resources Canada, wonderful linkages between the departments in Canada and the departments in the United States, which are really important to get the actual work done. Also important are going to be members of parliament. Members of parliament develop their own relationships with Congress people, with senators in the United States, and they want to be able to utilize those relationships in order to get a fair hearing and to and to advocate for things that are important to the, especially the states that border on the United States and Canada. Cabinet ministers are going to be important. Oftentimes, they're going to be fed information by the uh, officials with those relationships that are already in place. But I was really happy to hear that uh, most of the cabinet ministers have already uh, had conversations with their counterparts, their secretaries in the United States. And that's a really important first step. Uh, that was one of the first calls that always happened on a shuffle was making sure that you had a conversation with the, the opposite member of the United States cabinet. Prime Minister's office is going to be incredibly important too. And, and as you can see, there is already great lines of communication that have been opened up between Prime Minister's office and the Biden administration. And finally, like to your point, do not underestimate civil society. Don't underestimate the power of union representation in terms of uh, interventions on both Canada and the United States side. Jerry Dias has been a very vocal supporter of ensuring that Canada is part of the electric vehicle discussion and debate on both sides. And I think that's certainly a voice that's going to be important moving forward as long as well as the chambers and the subnational governments, MPPs, MLAs across the country too, and all of their various connections. So lots of places and lots of opportunity for connection. But that being said, you need to have the overall direction, which is going to be the relationship that is going to be developed between the prime minister's office and what's happening in the Biden administration. And we have to figure out what the signals are to determine how to best implement the resources we have and develop the relationship and keep it going and to avoid um, the minor irritants that happen along the way, which can become major problems for the Canadian economy, as Jack Mintz pointed out. Fantastic, Lisa. Um, I really like the emphasis on how many different people are already currently working on this issue. Uh, this is not one where the sort of both countries are sitting back and saying, what's that president going to do? And what's the prime minister going to say in response? Um, I, I suspect that the, the day after the election, the phone started humming um, back and forth across the border. And, and I think one of the things that if you go back 20 years, you, and you were a big part of this for a long time, that there's an entire network of very talented people in the private sector, in the public sector, in civil society, sort of already at work on this relationship. So much as important as the president and the prime minister may be, there's an awful lot more of a, of a foundation there, or perhaps a, a safety net underneath that political relationship that's really critical. Thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, delighted now to introduce J.P. Gladeau. Uh, J.P. Gladeau is uh, perhaps Canada's leading proponent of Indigenous business development. Uh, he certainly is the biggest champion this country has seen of, of developing Indigenous uh, commercial activity. He was for uh, many years the head of the Canadian Council on Aboriginal Business and as such developed a truly impressive national and international uh, profile. I mean, he's now the president of the Alaska to Alberta Railway, um, and he is actually living exactly what we're talking about today, a trans-border infrastructure project that relates to oil and gas, perhaps, but also relates to infrastructure and to international cooperation. Uh, JP, welcome your first comments. Thank you, Ken. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be on a, a panel with uh, Lisa, Gary, and Scotty. And I'm, as you've mentioned, um, you know, a lot of my, my, my experience in the past has been in domestic energy. Uh, of course, that has global implications, but to uh, be cutting my teeth on Alaska to, uh, to Alberta Railway is, is truly uh, an incredible learning curve for me. We, you know, we need to recognize, of course, that both of our countries are, are energy superpowers. We both enjoyed, uh, for the most part, high levels of prosperity based on energy production processes and use. Um, you know, we you know we also share a common uh, environmental destiny when we talk about uh, climate conditions, like the recent polar vortex. And I was saying, <laughs> I'm normally on my First Nation uh, northeast of Thunder Bay, and I was out fishing, ice fishing in minus 45. Probably not the smartest thing to be doing, but uh, definitely it wasn't too fun uh, as far as the temperature goes. But as you know, as the climate changes, you know, we have to realize that we've got this shared ecological destiny and the search for solutions. We really have to be uh, coordinated on that work across the boundaries. You know, there's two fundamental challenges. Um, you know, one convincing America that we in Canada matter uh, in the past, in the present, and going into the future, and that continental solutions are really in, in everybody's interest. 
and also convincing Canadians that America is a vital part of Canada's prosperity as a series of markets and a source of investment capital, ideas, entrepreneurial drive, and, and global connections. So finding that balance is really quite essential. You know, recognizing the sovereignty and respect um, of, of our independent uh, nations, uh, building beyond the, the current structures of collaboration to facilitate even greater cooperation and, and you know, mutually beneficial partnerships. So we need to really stay up to date on the arrangements uh, res to respect as, you know, the, 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 our, our world is moving fast. The 21st century is, is exponential in the way that we're moving. Um, you know, kind of a quick reflection on, on COVID-19, we, we ended up in, in taking two different approaches in our countries, uh, and we share a, a, a long, the, long, the longest border in, in, in the world between our countries. You know, we've, we've done really well, I think, uh, on, on energy until recently, as, as uh, it's been mentioned with regards to the cancellation of Keystone. And so these cracks are starting to, to emerge. And, and that's going to fundamentally impact our relationships. And anytime you go through tough times in relationships, one of two things are going to happen. I hope it's the latter. One, that you continue to, to dig deeper and, and divide. Or two, you find, uh, you know, when you get in the trenches together, you find solutions because you recognize you're stronger together than apart. So we need to build across those borders. We can collaborate on the energy and the environment. And, and, and you know, one thing, you know, as an Indigenous person, um, involved heavily in indigenous issues in this in this country um, it's one of the one of the relationships that we need to start bringing closer to the front uh, of, of, of of the stage especially with Canada and undrip and c15 these these indigenous issues are going to continue to um, um, sway uh, quite frankly the ability of, of our country and we'll start to see some of it in the states as well so it's uh, I think we're, we're we're poised for some really great change but it's going to take some work Ken Thanks very much, JP, and I really appreciate you bringing up sort of not just the, the Indigenous issue as though it's a simple process. In fact, the Indigenous mm -hmm. issue is very complicated on the commercial side, environmental side, across border side. These are really vital things. I like, too, the fact that you're, you're emphasizing the, 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 the speed with which we have to make decisions these days. If you go back to the start of COVID-19, we've made phenomenal decisions on all around the world very, very quickly. And we're having to do that on so many fronts with climate change, energy, infrastructure, things of that sort. And, and the institutions that served us well 40 years ago might not be so helpful in the, in the 21st century. So we have to modernize our relationships. Thanks very much, JP. I very much appreciated that. Um, our last uh, speaker after opening comments, uh, Mary Scott Greenwood, and I actually have her, permi her permission to call her Scotty. Um, the old traditional part of me, uh, Scotty, has trouble ca calling somebody as impressive as you by, the, by that kind of a name, but it's delight delighted to have you with us today. Uh, former Chief of Staff to <coughs> United States Ambassador to Canada, Gordon Giffen, uh, a, a partner in uh, Crestview uh, Strategy uh, in the United States, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian American Business Council, and, and we've known Scotty for a long time in different contexts. I see your name all the time as perhaps, uh, if not the, one of the leading experts on Canada-U.S. relations in the United States. Uh, a good friend of, of Canada, um, but somebody who brings a very critical perspective to bear on that relationship. Uh, Scotty, over to you. Oh, gosh. Well, thank you so much. And it's really good to be with you. It's good to um, I like playing cleanup batter here so I can um, kind of pull from what uh, my distinguished colleagues uh, have said uh, and, 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 and add a little bit of perspective. So um, uh, Ambassador Dewar talked about uh, about the elections um, and the election of President Biden, which matters a lot to the Canada U.S. relationship. And Minister Raitt uh, talked about the other players. Uh, so Congress is incredibly important. And it's important to um, think about the position that Biden finds himself in, which is a um, a narrowed majority of Democrats in the House. Um, so it's getting tight over there um, and a literal 50-50 tie in the Senate. And unlike in Canada, where if you've got a majority government, you can kind of run the table. In the United States, the White House is really only one player. Uh, it's an important player, but but Congress is equally important. And so um, when we think about energy, and when we think about energy and we think about um, the KXL decision, you know, Jack Mintz had some very pr provocative ideas. Uh, one that he mentioned is maybe there should be retaliation. Uh, Canada should uh, retaliate with the digital services uh, tax against presumably the big U.S. companies. The, the, the challenge there, it seems to me, is if Canada were to do that, it would have needed to signal 
a giant problem um, before the announcement. So you would have had to, instead of have this sort of like, let's rip the bandaid off approach with KXL, you would have had to say, uh, wait a second, this is going to be a huge problem uh, for us and let's talk about it and let's try to figure it out. That's not um, exactly the way it unfolded. Uh, so I think retaliation at this point um, is something that is fraught and, and we could talk about that. But the other thing we need to understand is that KXL uh, that decision doesn't actually advance the Biden climate agenda. It, it was a, a political move for sure. But when you think about uh, the Biden administration's approach to climate, um, there are, as a practical matter, there are kind of three main sources of planet warming greenhouse gases in the U.S. economy. And KXL doesn't, uh, doesn't actually add uh, to the carbon problem, as we know from Secretary Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, State Department report about the carbon impact of KXL. So there are other things about KXL, but from a planetary impact, um, the the pipeline itself isn't isn't really the problem. The the problems in the U.S. economy are one pollution from cars. I got to deal with that. Two pollution from power plants, and three leaking methane from oil and gas wells. Methane being a much more potent um, heat trapping substance than, 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 um, others. And, and, and so when you think about those three areas, the, the cooperation on, um, on vehicles is an area where Canada and the United States already make vehicles together. And previous administrations have set out, uh, joint goals on, uh, in North America, actually Canada, the U S um, and Mexico about how we're going to approach um, emission standards and all of that. So I think, and, and we've seen a move towards electric vehicles. So uh, that is an area for potential cooperation that's quite meaningful um, uh, in, in North America. In, in terms of power plants, uh, you, you have a, a different situation. Ambassador Dewar mentioned um, the hydropower that comes from Canada um, into the United States. And uh, if, if, and, and so if you could look at ways to um, enhance that interconnectivity and, and that exchange uh, between the U.S. and Canada in the power sector, that would be amazing. There's there's one, I'll just mention one example um, uh, of a power company that is doing some really interesting things on climate. And it's an Alberta company called Capital Power. And they've invested in a technology that actually captures carbon out of the atmosphere, turns it into nanotubes that you can then like mix into cement to build your infrastructure. So imagine a great infrastructure collaboration where you're actually reducing carbon um, and and building new infrastructure. There are really exciting things like that uh, between Canada and the United States that we could really look at doing more of. So I think I, as as frustrating as as the KXL decision is, and as um, and, and as much as it doesn't advance. Canada US issues. I do think there are areas um, where we can collaborate quite a lot. And uh, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about them. So thanks for having me. Well, Scotty, it's our, our great pleasure to have you have you with us. And among many things that you said that really resonate with me, um, I like the reminder that politics matters, uh, particularly the, the, the challenge for Canadians to understand the American political system. Uh, you know, you know, the role of Congress, the role of individual representatives and senators, um, and the fact that, you know, the central administration doesn't necessarily control everything in the way we're used to in Canada. We it's tend to see government... to understand that too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, bet, I'll bet it does. And, and I, really, I really like too that this, your, your, your this reminder of the complexity of the issues. You know, let's not, let's not get caught up in too many in the symbols. There, there are lots of parts to the climate change debate, to environmental issues. You mentioned methane, you mentioned some of the, <clears throat> the, the carbon nanotube sort of idea. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. <clears throat> and, and sort of JP was saying, in terms of the complexity and speed with which things are changing, we better up our game in terms of responding to these. So thank you very much. Um, so listen, everybody, a wonderful, wonderful way to start. This is just fantastic. Um, so uh, it's my great pleasure now to be able to, you know, to put you all on the hot spot and to ask you a series of series of questions. And I'll, I will give you a bit of a warning about who's going to be asked each question. So you have maybe five seconds to prepare. So the, the first one, I'm going to go back to Scotty and then to JP. So Scotty first. Um, when, when you look at this from a purely political point of view, uh, President Biden, Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau seem like pretty natural allies, much more so, obviously, than the situation with Prime Minister uh, Trudeau and, and President Trump. Um, is, 
Is President Biden our new best friend? Uh, or can we anticipate significant challenges in the relationship? Are we going to see the, 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 the glow come off this relationship fairly quickly between Canada and the United States? Scotty, well, do you I first? Said- yeah, let's be honest. The, the, like the the best friend status has has really eroded um, in the last four years for for reasons that are not Canada's fault. Okay, um, and and so I think I, I think uh, Biden, President Biden, is very interested in engaging it with allies. So Canada becomes um, comes back to good friends with the U.S. Um, a key ally. Is there a first among equals here? Uh, at the moment, I don't. I don't know. That's gonna. That's gonna take some work. There. There are lots of good reasons why Canada should be first among equals. Um, but JP was absolutely right when he said, you know, Canada's got to show how it's relevant. So Canada obviously sits on a very important strategic piece of geography that'll never change. But in addition to that, um, what is there? Uh, and so I think there are there are some opportunities. Um, in in re- recovering the economy together, in not competing against each other, but helping each other move forward. We can talk a little bit later if you want about um, critical minerals and rare earths. I think there's a, a a massive role for Canada to play. That conversation's already started, but it's not going fast enough. Anyway, so so good friends, um, close allies, but best friend, first among equals. That's going to be um, that's going to require work on both sides and more work as usual, by the Canadian side, if, if you want to have that statu- status back. I don't think we'll get back to the bromance, uh, that, that sort of magical relationship between President Obama and Prime Minister Trudeau. That was a, that was a particular uh, moment in time with a couple of individuals. But I do think a uh, good collaborative working relationship, absolutely. Great. Thanks very much, Scotty. JP, you want to follow up? You're on mute, my friend. Darn, I thought I would get through today without you're on the, on the mute <laughs> comment. Sorry, everybody, I blew it. Uh, <laughs> no, absolutely. I, you know, picking up on on relationships between individuals, of course, is, is cyclical. And we had that wonderful bromance that was very short lived to, as you said, Scotty, four years of, of some challenges that uh, Canada had very little um, um, influence over. Um, so we need to really think about the long-term um, presence of our two countries and our and our current prime minister and the and and the president. And we've got hundreds of thousands of touch points, as you mentioned, Scotty. Um, we've got to prove our relevance. I mean, we've got American fishers up in the north. We've got our uh, Canadian snowbirds. We've got um, we've got um, loft softwood lumber issues that are always you know we've got some incredible resources. Canada is has been blessed with incredible natural resources and and our ability to get that out to support global markets is going to be really important. And these tariffs that happen uh, has have happened in the past with with uh, aluminum, etc. We've got to find uh, ways uh, because to get through those impasses, I think it's going to be really foolish to think that we're we're not going to have um, considerable challenges ahead. Uh, between our political leaders. And, you know, just to pick up again, it's it's really incumbent on on our countries to to find those paths forward and the, and the stronger together. So um, not much more to add to that, uh, Ken and Scotty. Great. Thanks very much, JP. Very interesting to sort of figure out the relationship's always been a little bit unequal. Um, Canadians are, are more entrenched with America than Americans with Canadians. And uh, uh, that's just, just part of the game. And we have to figure our way around that. Um, yeah, but, Can- wanna- but Canadians have more... Uh, of a whole bunch of things that the United States needs. So this asymmetry argument is not exactly um, is not exactly right because Canadians have um, all of the natural resources and fresh water that the U.S. is going to want and need forever. So anyway, I just as as the token American here, you know, like <laughs> it's, not, it's not always the elephant in the mouse. You know, there there are some areas where Canada really. Um, really has the advantage. I just had to bring it up. And I, and I would add hockey players and comedians to that list too. So we, Canada, <laughs> Canada has lots to contribute. Um, absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So, so a question, uh, for, first going to Gary and then, and then to Lisa, a two-part question. Um, what are Canada's interest in this relationship? Can you sort of target that down a bit? And how do we, how do we advance those interests? Uh, uh, do we look for partnerships? Do we do this in a quiet and collaborate way? We've had suggestions from Jack and, 
and others about about more aggressive responses of you know uh, retaliation and new tariffs and things of that sort. Um, quiet backroom protest is that the best way to go? Um, and, and in particular, Gary, you you were a premier, but then you also spent all that time in Washington so successfully. What is the role of subnational governments on both sides of the border? We tend to look at this as a Canada U.S. issue, but you know if you look at line five, the issue there is really about Michigan. If you look at hydropower, it's about Manitoba, but it's also about Quebec and about the New England states. If you look at oil and gas, it's about Alberta. So, uh, and, and obviously Texas and other places. So, so what are Canada's interests? How do we push them forward? And what role do subnational governments play? Over to you, Gary. Well, on the macro, I also want to mention, in terms of our relationship with the United States, that the military with Canada and the United States has a tremendous relationship, including... Uh, the Continental Protection uh, run out of Colorado and NORAD. And we also help share a tremendous amount of information on intelligence, uh, cybersecurity, and other things. And that's why, you know, we can't neglect to say when I was in Washington, I very much made it clear to the government and the Prime Minister made a decision on Huawei, uh, which the five eyes have all determined in the past to not be in the public interest of each of the five countries in Canada still has to make a decision in that regard. That is going to be very important uh, to the Biden administration, believe me. On subnational governments, uh, they're an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, Advantage, uh, California brought in the tailpipe emission standards. Many provinces joined in on that proposal. The late Jim Prentice then was the lead negotiator with the United States to bring in the same Uh, emission standards for vehicles on both sides of the border uh, on the same day, the same hour, and the same minute. And that was extremely positive, both for cleaner air and also for the trade relationship in the auto industry that Lisa talked about uh, previously. Uh, So that's a positive example. Uh, New York State buying hydropower, positive. Uh, Massachusetts wanting uh, hydropower, very positive. New Hampshire blocking a transmission line for 10 years as a subnational government, very negative. Now, Hydro-Quebec is now trying to bring that same transmission line of clean energy uh, through uh, Maine after being blocked for 10 years. So it's not all just traditional fuel, uh, traditional energy that gets blocked. Uh, with line three, we are proceeding uh, in Minnesota. They too wrote a report like Hillary Clinton's report that it was environmentally more safe to have oil on pipelines than rail. That was a report done in Minnesota. I agree with that. Hopefully that the Prime Minister will be able to land that plane in the short term. Uh, South Flanagan, uh, the governor of Missouri, uh, Governor Nixon, totally supported that project. That project went ahead. And one of the pipelines that went ahead, Clipper Project had support from subnational governments. And now we have Line 5. So we have a situation where Line 5 is really a pipe from Canada through the United States back into Canada. And Line 5 presently is on, in the Michigan-Ontario border, it's on the lake bed. And the proposal a few years ago with Governor Snyder was actually to bury the pipeline underneath uh, the lake bed, which would be safer uh, for, uh, even though there's never been a spill in 60 years. And now it's being blocked by uh, the governor of Michigan And that will hurt the subnational government of Ontario and Quebec. And so an old treaty signed by Prime Minister Trudeau Sr. and uh, uh, voted on in a positive way by former Senator Biden has got to be brought to fore again uh, to get reliability of energy and have a safer route uh, on the lake uh, rather than an unsafer route that exists today. So it is like subnational governments are both a blessing and uh, we too can be a curse in, in provincial government action. I recall when uh, when uh, the former Premier of uh, British Columbia, Christy Clark, provided the five conditions to get Northern Gateway Project approved and stopped it until then. Uh, Governor uh, Senator Schumer from New York, this two days later, said, you want Keystone Pipeline built? You won't even approve a pipeline in your own country. So it's not if they don't pay attention to what's going on in Energy East or the Northern Gateway Project in the Senate in the United States and are very aware of the arguments. You want us to approve a pipeline, but you won't do one yourself in Canada. So that does affect us. That's a long answer to a short question. 
but there's a lot of moving parts. Thank you. <laughs> That's a great answer, Gary. Thank you very, very much. Lisa, your thoughts? Well, if I were confronted with the litany of problems that the ambassador just put forward there as a former politician, I would say, but remember folks, the relationship is bigger than the problems that we're encountering. And that's the talking point that you're gonna hear from politicians, which it's true. And if I may peel it back and go up a little bit of a higher level, I'm, I'm trying to figure out when the last time was that we had the possibility of two governments on either side of the border that are so in line on issues of climate, on issues of, of energy, of issues of infrastructure in terms of ideological uh, uh, leanings. And this should be a really positive attribute. On the other side of it though is, you know, the devil is the details. And we're seeing once again, um, Buy America ha have lots of conversations around it. And I do believe that that is an area of interest in the relationship that has to have very close and careful analysis and, and the reason being is we can talk about the the wonderful opportunities we have uh, in terms of clean tech and we can talk about our great opportunities in terms of moving forward together but the reality is is that if the old tropes of protectionism come back into play canada if we're not very careful and watchful could very much find itself on the outside despite the fact there's so much similarity between what we have in administration in canada and what we have in administration in the united states um, oftentimes out of conflict comes process. That's the one thing that politicians like to put in place in order to work through a program or a problem. And in the past, uh, we've had the clean energy dialogue and, and we've had beyond borders when we had issues with respect to the border thickening. And, you know, Scotty did so much work in this area. You know, this chapter and verse, it's really important to have those hard infrastructure pieces in place between administrations, a place, a forum where you can go and have general discussions on issues that may be coming down in terms of, of future relationships across the border and projects that are coming or, or projects that you'd like to get off the ground. And that's why I think it's important for federally for this government to really try to put in place some concrete places for discussion and concrete reporting accountable uh, groups of folks on both sides of the border to come back to talk about um, broader policy issues where you can still find the room and the space inside to deal with or have conversations about uh, the issues like line five and, and line three and and uh, what may be happening or not happening in New England with respect to Hydro-Quebec going through Maine into New England and, and Massachusetts. So I, um, you know, from my point of view, Ken, it's, it is a blessing we have. I the opportunity in the next four years to work closely together on on matters of, of interest, common interest is great. On the other hand, the the old issues of protectionism and the old issues of, uh, of ensuring that uh, there's a great amount of cooperation across the border are still going to be there. And unless we have the framework that's really embedded, it's going to be difficult to continuously deal with these issues that are going to be coming our way. Thank you very, very much, uh, Alisa. I appreciate that. And Gary, very, very much. I mean, neither of you is favoring a confrontational approach. Um, you're talking about process. You're talking about structure. You're talking about looking at the broader picture. Um, and, and I think I always think that's a really important piece. You know, you it's a situation where you, Canada and the United States agree on 95% of things and we disagree on five or whatever the numbers are. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes the 5% yeah. become real irritants. Um, but we have to remember the other 95, where actually our co countries are so closely linked together in so many positive ways. Um, Scotty and, and then JP, I'm going to turn the question back to uh, issues of, um, uh, of of indigenous peoples and their relationship to this broader broader sort of issue. In the in the cancellation of Keystone XL in, in Canada and in the United States, but also in in Canada, when Canada talks about things like Trans Mountain and pipeline and and even Energy East, but certainly uh, the case with uh, with Northern Gateway, um, governments all often cite Indigenous protests and Indigenous priorities as one of the rationales for their decisions. They they say, oh, we're on the side of Indigenous people. 
Um, but I, and I, and you, you got a bit of a setup here by having JP ready to answer the question because he knows this field better than anybody in the country. But a substantial number of indigenous communities support energy and infrastructure development. They're in favor of oil and gas development properly done. They're in favor of pipeline and, and railway development properly done. And in fact, many of these communities rely very heavily on, on energy revenues. In fact, it's the only way they support their sort of their basic programs. Um, I want to just ask a really troubling question. Why do country, governments in both countries seem to pay so little attention to support of indigenous communities, those communities that favor infrastructure and energy development and favor instead the protesters? Um, Scotty, to put you on the spot. Uh, this is a way better question for JP, so I'll go really fast <laughs> and then let, let uh, the expert uh, speak. Well, I mean, what, your question is, you know, why don't governments listen? The, the answer, at least in the case of the U.S. on infrastructure projects, is there isn't a monolithic indigenous First Nation uh, Native American voice. There are, you know, constituencies on various sides um, of, uh, uh, of these issues, and in particular on the pipeline issues, whether it's Dakota Access, whether it's KXL. Um, so it's not, it's not like, why isn't the administration listening? Um, the, 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 you know, there isn't, there isn't one solid message um, c coming out. I, I would say labor unions are way more um, uh, unified in their support of, uh, of, for example, the KXL project. Um, there, there are project labor agreements and all of that. So, 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 so th they are. You can kind of lump them together. But, um, but other constituencies have a have a broad, diverse um, set of interests, and they're and they're not, um, you know, they're not speaking with one voice uh, because they don't necessarily agree with each other. Yeah, thanks, yeah, so that, Scotty. JP, over to you. No, that, 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 that's fair, Scotty. And I think, you know, down in the States, it's it's absolutely If I did my undergraduate in the States and the Native American reservations are significantly larger and if you have resources, then you're blessed. And if you don't, you really don't have much say on BLM lands, uh, which is very different than in Canada. So there are two different structures um, that uh, that we're dealing with. But, you know, to, to Ken's uh, question, I think it's a combination of a few things. I think it's a combination of ignorance. I think it's a combination uh, of convenience and um, also the influence of, of uh, to your point, Scotty, you were making about um, you have different uh, uh, thoughts or bases of uh, perceptions or, or in support of or not. But in Canada, I think uh, there's a the, the minority, which is is it's got way too much bandwidth and influencing too much of the conversation in Canada. Because as you know, Ken and I know. There's over 100, approximately 120 Indigenous communities in Canada that, that are intimately involved with oil and gas production, and thousands of our people rely on those jobs, and billions of dollars um, are generated from those nations and the partnerships with the oil and gas companies to support those communities. And it's it's really frustrating to somebody like myself who, you know, I spend a lot of time in Alberta with all sorts of organizations um indigenous and non that are working collectively to to grow a more responsible oil and gas sector and you know unfortunately what I, what i've seen from from governments on both sides of the border is listening intently to one side in these heated debates and and unfortunately what happens the other side often gets largely ignored and project proponents you know tied to the global climate change movement garner support for the trudeau and biden administrations you know as, a, as an example when when we see the, the dakota pipeline action canadian indigenous communities hop on board and you know we we have diversity of thought of course we're not homogenous people but that's what gets picked up to my point in the um in too much bandwidth that all indigenous people are opposed to resource developments and that's far from the full story so, um, you know, you know, another point, you know, just reading some articles in Dakota and, and Utah, what's happening um, with the cancellation, uh, the, the pause on, on, on oil on federal lands. Well, Native American lands um, are, being, are being imposed upon by being told to pause their oil and gas. And, um, you know, I find this, again, very paternalistic uh, approach. And, um, and again, it it's becomes one of maybe perhaps convenience. These indigenous nations on both sides of the border, you know, we rely heavily on oil and gas sector and the cancellation of the, the Keystone XL is definitely going to harm, impact 
um, many communities. Um, you know, there was a billion dollars of equity with TC Energy with Indigenous communities in, in Alberta, which was it was just unfortunately not going to be realized right now. So it's, it's um, dis disconcerting to me that we can just make sweeping um, statements that, um, that 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 have significant impact on the communities, and we've got to pay more attention to um, to the real issues coming from the indigenous communities, and not just a portion of them, to really flesh out a, a broader and more in depth and comprehensive conversation in, in in both of our countries. Thanks, JP. That's very helpful. I mean, it, and then and this is one of the good sides of a contra of controversy like this when you have actually sort of finally get an airing of the issues, and you finally get to listen to different people come forward. You know, one of the things that's really happened in Canada over the last five to ten years, uh, largely through your work, to be honest, has been that the country's paying more attention to that indigenous business side, to the indigenous commercialization. And um, I'm not sure if you don't use the same language, Scotty, in the United States, but in Canada, the own source revenue, the idea that indigenous communities own, collect their own money, make their own money separate from the government of Canada, don't have to account for it, don't have to follow government rules and programs and that sort of thing, an absolutely critical part uh, of sort of the indigenous future, uh, which is why they're working so hard to move in that area. So perhaps out of this controversy, we get more clarity over time. So, so let's jump back into a broader question. Um, and this one for, for Gary first and then, and then for Lisa. Um, is it, and, and, and Jack mentioned this in his opening presentation as well. Is it possible or appropriate for Canada and the United States to consider a continental energy zone? zone? Is that what we should look for? A sort of a, an approach to energy that is completely continental and, and cross-border and integrated as much as possible with much more intense collaboration. Is that, is that a possible future? Uh, um, Gary, first to you and then to Lisa. Well, we tried that in the past to try to get a discussion not on just a, just energy, but also energy and the environment. Uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan were far ahead of uh, with regulations on methane gas, as Scotty talked about this. And, and we wanted to have a discussion about uh, the environment and energy together. And I still believe that's the way to go. Both of us have signed on to Paris. It's the... Uh, it's the uh, comes from the Copenhagen Agreement, which is different than Kyoto. Uh, Canada agreed to the Copenhagen Agreement and then Paris under both uh, Prime Minister Harper and Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, Joe Biden has agreed to it. And I think we have to discuss energy uh, renewables, including hydro, wind and solar and transmission lines, energy efficiency, light vehicles, appliances that are manufactured on both sides of the border, et cetera, uh, as part of a table. I think we've got to discuss methane gas on both sides of the border. I think there's other items on ozone depleting materials that could be updated from the Montreal Protocol. And we should have, but I think it would be very popular in the United States and in Canada to have clean uh, traditional energy policies that we work together on to make our traditional energies cleaner, but have complete reliability in the North American neighborhood as opposed to relying somewhat not as much as, not nearly as much as years ago on the, we, we should never rely, we don't have to rely on the Middle East. We can do it, have clean air and reliable energy in our own neighborhood. And I'd like to see both of those together in one table. If we have one part, just the energy part, we won't get anywhere in energy and we won't get anywhere in the environment. Thanks, yeah. thanks Gary, very optimistic. Lisa, over to you. I have optimism. Uh, I also have realism and uh, Jim Carr is back in cabinet and I'm so glad that he's healthy and well and that he's going to be taking this on is my understanding going back to what he had floated a number of years ago in terms of continental energy and where I'm realistic is Mexico is doing a whole bunch of other stuff that is antithetical to a relationship that would seem to want to move together progressively. And what they're doing is they're saying uh, private sector, not really welcome. We're going to give first first dibs on both production and on energy to state-owned enterprises. That is going to be really difficult to put um, Canada, the United States, and Mexico together in any kind of continental energy uh, environment type of agreements. Now, what I like about it, why I like the idea of having the three amigos back in town, is because it sets up accountability within your bureaucracy. You definitely are working towards having an announceable, which means you're working towards getting deals and you're actually getting people telling you 
what they think they want to happen in terms of carbon capture and storage, for example, in terms of transmission lines. And that is really important to keep all the, the pieces of the pie working together. So yes, I'd like to see an attempt to put together some kind of continental energy strategy. I would also say that we're gonna have to be realistic in terms of what is going to be acceptable. Back to trade. Um, you know, I'm very interested to see what the definition is going to be on component test. You know, how much is going to have to be U.S. Uh, U.S. Um, owned or U.S. Uh, developed, U.S. produced in terms of components for the electric vehicle? And does that mean Canada and Mexico are are kind of out of the picture? These are really important pieces as we move forward on clean energy, but swinging for the fences on, on saying that we need the North American strategy and anything less is not going to be as good. Um, I think there's a lot of in between that will be as good, recognizing that we do have some significant issues of pulling all the three countries together. But I'd still recommend, you know, uh, watching the space in terms of coming up with some things that can be agreed upon, specifically in the power generating area. That's interesting, Lisa. So your suggestion, I'm paraphrasing and making it much more simple than what you, your, your eloquent answer is essentially we need that kind of cooperation, but let's build it up incrementally from the bottom rather than waiting for some grand announcement about some, some super agreement that's going to last forever. Yeah, or at least find a way. You, you do need that overall, though, agreement that's going to drive it, but don't think it's going to be the bigger strategy. Like Gary talked about the working groups, announce one working group and move forward. Um, instead of having the big, uh, you know, grand signing a ceremony with everybody, because I think it's going to be really tough to get all three parties on the same page. Gary, can I get back to you on that. on that? Yes, please. Well, there is a Lisa identified a problem. Uh, Mexico did not show up at the uh, recent Paris uh, uh, declaration meeting, which, of course, the United States with Biden's election did. And so that is a bit of a pro there's no question that's a problem. Uh, in terms of, uh, of where we're going. But, I, you know, the way we handled, you know, we had a real mess. You know, we were dealing with the border. Over here, we were dealing, dealing with airports. Over there, we were dealing with land. Somewhere else, we were dealing with marine. And, and we came, you know, another place we were dealing with rail. We finally came together. And it took us, you know, Janet Napolitano was Secretary of Homeland Security. She understood that as a former governor. Uh, with the Biden administration, we actually got all four of those areas together to get a comprehensive agreement, which has now been passed in the Senate and in Parliament. In fact, the last body to approve it was the unelected Senate in Canada, dare I say that, and not be impeached by them. But uh, the, uh, the, you know, <laughs> it did take a little longer, but we did get an agreement. It, it was announced, it was started by Janet Napolitano with Canada, it was uh, Jay Johnson took it over and, and, and announced yeah. it in, I think, May of 2015. And, and it was ratified by both the Harper government and the Trudeau government as a very positive. So I'm optimistic. I, I don't think you can deal with energy without dealing with environment. And I don't think you can deal with environment without dealing with energy. So I think they go together like rail, roads, uh, air, and sea. If we can do that, Great. we can we can do this. We have the yeah. new ability to do <laughs> I love the spirit, Gary. Well, well done. Well said. Um, uh, for JP and then for Lisa, in that, uh, or, or for JP and then for Scotty, actually, we're going to switch it up a little bit. Um, the en energy infrastructure issues between Canada and the United States, right now they're focused on Keystone XL. And, and I think we've been very Canadian in our conversation so far, being quite polite. I, I know the reaction on the street in Alberta in particular has been much more vociferous and, and hostile than what we're portraying right now. There's some people who are really angry about the sense of betrayal they feel with, uh, with President Biden. But we now have debates about Line 3 and Line 5 um, that are already underway, and some of those are really troubling. Um, Gary's mentioned and others have mentioned the, the hydro relationships, that, that you know, this is lost revenue uh, that could be coming up to Canada in the billions of dollars, lost clean energy going into New England, and, and we're sort of all these impasses. So how serious are these conflicts? Are these relatively minor irritants that we can get rid of one at a time incrementally and, and build some sort of solution. So, JP, what do you think? Well, I, I think it's singular. It's conflict. And really, I think the debate and uh, is with real about it. I think it's, it's, it's really two sides. It's those that wish to develop and transport and consume 
one of the world's most important commodities, fossil fuel based energy supplies. And then the other side, those that choose to fight, um, uh, of course, climate change by focusing on a, on a subset of the, of the global producers of, of the energy. So like, you know, it was brought up earlier, Gary was talking about it and I think it was Scotty talking, well, everybody was talking about, uh, you know, the, the energy, the, the, the climate impact is happening a lot from, from our, our vehicles. So, but it's a lot easier for, for, for the, 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 the strong activists to, 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 to combat the major companies. So where are the protests in Texas or at major ports that are receiving energy suppliers from overseas? Because, you know, it's easier to have one point than to, to take the broader strokes to, to fight all of this. And so they, they know um, they have, you know, we all know we have legitimate concerns about climate change. And, but again, it's easier. I think it's more challenging, of course, to attack the consumers uh, side of the things. Um, and history shows that, you know, when, 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 when the climate activists attack and they win, uh, they'll move on to the next project. And right now it's three and five, but, these these pipelines, unlike Keystone, are absolutely, and I think Gary's talked about it, crucial to uh, to 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 Canada and North America. If they're disrupted, millions of consumers are going to be directly impacted. And then I'm, my my fear is that you know if these do get shut down, then and only then I think you know particularly on this side of the border, are Canadians going to really understand the pace of energy transition doesn't happen overnight, and um, and the importance of energy sovereignty. To make sure that we've we've because we are going to be reliant on oil and gas for 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 a long time. So again, I think the battle is is singular uh, that just takes on many forms uh, or many projects. Sorry, uh, it's either you're for or against, and there, I think we struggle as a nation or nations to actually find that transition or that pace of transition. Great, thank you, Scotty. Your thoughts? So you asked how serious it is, you, you know. Um, so line five in Michigan, it doesn't just um, deliver products from Canada to Canada through Michigan. Um, it also, 65% of the propane in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan comes from Line 5. So just think about that for a minute. If, if, if you canceled, if you stopped the flow today, how, how do those folks, I mean, Texas is having a cold wave. Imagine what it feels like in Michigan today. Um, so you've got to, it, it's a very serious issue. Um, it's not clear, by the way, it's, it's in the courts. Um, so anything that's full employment to lawyers is probably a bad idea with apologies to Lisa and anybody else who might be a lawyer uh, on this. Uh, but, you know, the, the governor's decision um, is, is before federal and state courts. And, and the federal courts may say, look, this is an interstate, international project. And governor, with all due respect, you don't have jurisdiction. That is a possible outcome. And then you've also got state courts that might say, uh, you, you know, this thing has been around for 65 years. There is a properly permitted tunnel alternative that uh, Ambassador Dewar mentioned. Uh, the deal was cut with governor's predecessor. Uh, allow, you know, the, pro the proponents, Enbridge, to spend the, the hundreds of millions of dollars to take this and make it even safer. The courts may say, you got to do that. So, um, so it's, a, it's, it's very serious. It's not just a Canada-US issue. Um, although Canada, Canada and the United States um, are really interested, and I know there are lots of dialogues uh, going on at very senior levels to figure out how we can get through it, but you got to get through the legal process. You've got to look at the reality of the tunnel alternative under the Straits of Mackinac, which is what's been proposed, um, and then you got to see where we come out at the end of that. But it's not just important to Canada. It's a, it, it is important uh, jet fuel in Detroit, propane in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, like there are uh, real American interests that are also at stake here. And I think we need to understand mm -hmm. this as well. Thanks, Scotty. That helps a ton. We've got a, 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 some minutes for some audience questions. Um, and some people are coming in with questions through the chat, and I've got some we've received before. Um, so uh, Jerry asked this first question. Lisa, I'm going to direct it to you if you don't mind. Is it possible for Canada to diversify its energy market away from the United States? Is that a realistic plan? In some forms, for sure. Um, and I would say future energy hydrogen, for sure. That is something that uh, any administration should be taking a look at right now. If, if the next way that we're going to be fueling heavy machinery in this world is going to be through hydrogen fuel cells, and we have the ability to create hydrogen from a great natural gas supply, well, then we should be thinking about not missing the boat as we did in the past on LNG and figuring out where in the world we can send hydrogen to. 
And that would be uh, not just the United States, but through other markets as well. So it's one of those things where it's not just thinking about oil and natural gas right now or liquefied natural gas or or hydro or which would be difficult to send, by the way, any other way than to the United States, hard to diversify there. But it's uh, certainly something as the, the new ways of, of creating energy come on board, you do think about diversification. And a good example is uranium. You know, we export our uranium to the world. It's not just going into the United States. So as as new ways to create power is, is happening and, and movement, then uh, that's definitely what Canada should be taking a look at. Hey, can, can I just jump in here? Because a gal from sure. Cape Breton ought, ought to also put a shout out to Tidal Energy. The Bay of Fundy, no, in, <laughs> uh, the Bay of Fundy has the largest tides in the world, and there are some amazing projects um, that have lots of failures over 100 years on trying to capture yeah. that, but there are some amazing technologies and projects now. And if you could figure out how to capture um, the power of the moon, uh, you know, capture yeah. tidal energy, it would be a game changer. And Nova Scotia is really leading the way on that. So I just had to give a shout out uh, to uh, to that kind of energy. That's that is a Canadian innovation um, that uh, that can be world changing. The next biggest tidal energy come is or the next biggest um, tidal difference is the Bay uh, of Bengal in India. And we know that uh, bringing India off of coal is awfully important to the global um uh, GHG challenge. So anyway, lots of exciting things happening. And no, I'm it's true. I'm glad you referenced the, uh, the, the mistakes or the, the non-successful projects. I feel like I funded most of those when I was the natural resources <laughs> minister, the ones that didn't work. So I got a few scars from that one, but thanks for the, I agree with you hundred percent, Scotty. There's lots of, of technology innovation, not just supply of energy and carbon capture, carbon engineering, does some great work too from air carbon capture. So yeah, all kinds of great stuff out there. Yeah, and it's about carbon capture and utilization now, as I mentioned, the nanotubes, not just not just capturing yeah. it and storing it, but capturing it and using it in a way to make infrastructure stronger and more durable. How brilliant is that? Yeah. That's a nice optimistic sort of set. Gary, uh, um, back to real politics. Do you think the KXL uh, cancellation is a temporary sort of one-off act by the Biden administration? Or is it a signal of a more permanent direction of energy policy and attitudes toward Canada? And that question comes from Maureen. Well, KXL, uh, you talk, you know, it's the 10th anniversary of Hillary Clinton's uh, State Department report that said it would made a lot more sense for oil to be on uh, the KXL pipeline than being on rail, uh, both from an environmental perspective and cost and, and, and safety. Uh, Regrettably, the, the state of Nebraska disagreed with the route. And 10 years later, uh, we've still, we're still got this mess with, we can't get it, 11, uh, what, seven states out of eight approved it and, and one didn't. And now we have this uh, situation with the president. Uh, he, of course, made his commitment during the middle of the primaries. He didn't make it well, you know, when he was elected president. And that obviously was dealing with the reality of him. He was trying to secure the nomination. And I think I do think it's unfortunate that the building trade delegates in the Democratic Party weren't able to have as much power at the time in May of, uh, of last year than the environmental lobbyists, with uh, particularly uh, with the threat of Sanders still staying in the race. So I, I don't think it was based, I think it was politics uh, in terms of the pledge in, in uh, last year with the uh, pipeline, and uh, it was uh, an election promise to his party more than anything else, because the American public still support it in public opinion polls. Uh, but I do think that the Prime Minister is right to move on uh, to line three, land that plane, land the plane uh, of line five, uh, land the plane of a Quebec hydro to Massachusetts transmission line, uh, you've got to decide where you're going to spend your energy. And we've got some, can, uh, you know, we've got some items on our to-do list that we are very, very important. And I think that uh, has to be the priority right now, regrettably, on, uh, due to the uh, decision made by the prime minister or the president on Keystone. You know, Ambassador Dewey, you used to, you used to talk about putting the puck in the net. And I noticed now that yeah. you're on the Air Canada board. Air Canada board. <laughs> 
used to be put the puck in the net. Now it's laying the plane. We got it now. We <laughs> well, you, you, the old saying was you don't put your uh, – it's until you put the puck in the net, you can't put your hands in the air. So I still, we, we can't put our hands in the air. Amazing. <laughs> Let's let me ask one last question before we go to sort of concluding comments. And and it, it, this discussion has been just fabulous, folks. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, so JP, just just uh, quickly to you, um, what will the cancellation of? Let's be really practical about this. What will the cancellation of of Keystone mean for Alberta's ability to be an engine for the Canada's economic recovery? We're coming out of a pandemic. The recovery is going to be front and center for everybody's conversation. Alberta has driven the Canadian economy from Newfoundland to British. Columbia for for decades now, um, and so this is a question that uh, that Bill has asked, and I really appreciate your thoughts, JP. Well, it's severe and it's quite serious. You know, uh, Ken, you know my story. I was set to uh, to head out to um, Alberta after CCAB to run one of Canada's largest Indigenous oil and gas site services companies of a thousand plus strong, and uh, oil price dipped and uh, COVID hit, and uh, <laughs> I was no longer heading to Alberta. But the company had let off over half of their workforce. Um, you know, I, I, call, I consider Alberta a second home to me. I spend a lot of time out there. I'm the chair of, um, of a large Indigenous Economic Development Corporation, Mikasu, uh, you know, just newly appointed to the Suncor board. And, and you know, I, I spend time downtown Calgary. And you, you see the impact of this um, uh, downtown with the office spaces. We're not going back to the way work was. And then you look at, at Alberta's oil revenues flowing to Ottawa. We're not going to have the same revenue. And, and what's going to happen is that Alberta is going to have to find new ways of generating uh, revenue. And that's going to be more provincial. I think there's going to be less resources going to the federal coffers, which I think Canadians, I think, often don't understand that, that the oil and gas sector is a major contributor to our, 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 our way of life, our life, our, our, our GDP standings. And, you know, this is going to be significant. So uh, I don't know how much more I can say about that, Ken, is that uh, this is very serious and um, we have to find ways in which to, 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 to continue to be competitive in, in, in getting more competitive for every uh, barrel of oil that comes out of the ground to, as well as gas and, um, finding ways to be responsible and, and meeting, you know, I absolutely agree. We have to do better. Um, you know, we've got to keep pace with, with the U S or we're not going to, um, uh, you know, climate, uh, Paris accord. You know, these are all things we've got to step up to. Absolutely. And I think companies are, but it's, it is definitely a major shock to the system. Yeah. And a, and a good reminder, I, as some of you will know, I'm from Saskatchewan uh, and, but also from the Yukon and, and this stuff ripples through It ripples through the Canadian economy, um, you know, listen to people in, New, in Newfoundland to know how serious this is uh, as well. So very serious, very significant issue. So I'm going to give you each one minute to sort of wrap up your thoughts because you've been brilliant, absolutely wonderful, insightful sort of thoughts. Um, but I want you to do is, is um, cast your, your thoughts for four years ahead. Um, it's the end of uh, President Biden's first term. Either you come back for a second one or moving on. Um, and, and I want you to think about I'm going to give you four scenarios of where you think we might actually be in terms of uh, Canada-U.S. relations um, on issues of energy, the environment, and border crossings generally. These are these are major issues, as you've all so brilliantly articulated for us today. Um, number one, best friends again. Um, we'll go back to Reagan and Mulroney singing Irish songs, uh, big hugs on the stage with that. Um, cautious allies, uh, but substantial suspicions. In other words, you know, sort of moving back together. Um, reluctant neighbors, uh, building stronger walls, another scenario that might be there, There's more walls than bridges in, in the future, uh, or frustrated rivals um, uh, with uh, lingering resentments built up over things like Keystone XL, but also tied to other issues of energy and infrastructure going forward. So I'm going to ask you each in turn to give you your sort of one second, one, one minute thoughts on where we're going to be four years from now, realizing that everything can change and we won't come back and hold you fully responsible for what you say. But Scotty, uh, we're going to ask you to go first, if you don't mind. I choose none of the above. Uh, I don't like any of those formulations. I think Canada and the United States are very close partners and four years from now, we will have worked together on a number of the priorities. You know, Lisa mentioned how aligned we are on some of the biggest issues facing the planet. I think 
Um, I think we will rebuild our relationship. We will, so it won't, we won't be frustrated. We won't be rivals. Uh, we won't be best friends, but I think we will be very, very close partners. And, you know, I, for one, am wor work on that every single day. So I think that's where we'll be, Ken. Uh, it's great to have you doing that work, Scotty. You've been brilliant at all of that. Uh, Gary, over to you. Well, I agree with Scotty. I think it'll be a, a, a respectful, uh, constructive uh, relationship with lots of results. I think we are going to up our game on the knowledge area of cooperation, uh, including healthcare and other areas of intellectual importance to both our countries and our citizens. Uh, I think we'll solve a lot of problems. We'll have disputes that will lead the news. Uh, you talked about Mulroney, Irish eyes are smiling. I would warn people that if the UK gets in a fight with Ireland, uh, Joe Biden will side with Ireland. Uh, and uh, they should be very, I warn people that, that in the Brexit negotiations, the, the, there's more support for Ireland in Washington than there is uh, in, uh, in for Britain, but uh, you know, uh, you just go by St. Patty's Day in, 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 in DC. Uh, having said that, you know, we may not be singing Irish eyes or smiling, but we had disputes before on culture uh, between our countries and trade. And, and I would like to let our American friends know that we don't fight about culture anymore because the American culture is decided by a Canadian. Saturday Night Live is run by Lauren Michaels. <laughs> and four years from now, Lauren Michaels will still be running Saturday Night Live. And our secret weapon on culture is we control Saturday Night Live. <laughs> we can't have Keystone XL, but we can have Saturday Night Live. Interesting, interesting perspective. Uh, JP, your last thoughts. Uh, you know, I don't know how you how, how somebody like me uh, has a, a crystal ball that would be anywhere clearer than these incredible people on the panel have had a lot of experience uh, working in uh, with the states and we're being in the states. Um, but I, but I like to think that we're going to come back and recognize that we're intertwined, like significantly we all know that we you know we have family on both sides of the border um our, our climates are chain are tied our economies are tied and i think you know, after every shift in the pendulum to, to any leadership um it will come back i mean we have to find that uh that that that, that more that more I don't want to say comfortable because sometimes being neighbors isn't necessarily about being comfortable um but i think we're going to come to realize um um that we've got a um strengths on both sides of the border. And I want to pick up, and Scotty, thanks again for recognizing at the beginning about how well endowed we are as a country in Canada and all the resources uh, and the innovation that's starting to happen up here um, and how important that is in the global context. And if we can establish, you know, get through this this tough time together right now and figuring out how our, we're going to pace uh, climate solutions together, I think, I, think, I think we're going to recognize we're stronger together. Thanks, JP. Wonderful thoughts. Uh, Lisa, the last uh, thoughts to you. Well, I hope at the end of four years is that there'll be a mutual respect and neither party takes each other for granted, much like any good marriage. And I would also say that for me, this is an incredible opportunity. The next four years is an incredible opportunity for Canada and we need to be smart and we need to be tough and we need to be prepared. And we need to be principled in terms of what we want to accomplish for Canada going forward and not assume that because we line up on, on energy and environment and other matters that it's going to be a cakewalk. We're still going to have to have tough negotiations across the border and we have to stand up for what we feel is in the best interests of Canada and do so in a respectful way. But recognize there's a lane of opportunity here that we have not had in many, many years. And it's our time to seize it. And that's exactly what we should be trying to do, taking down all the, the partisan side of it all. We should really be working together to, to get that job done and see this as a, a remarkable opportunity of growth for the next four years. Oh, Lisa, what a wonderful, what a wonderful way to finish our, our time together here. That was, uh, it was brilliant from all of you. Five great speakers. Uh, Jack's not uh, available to be with us live, but his, his thoughts certainly got off us to a provocative start. I love the, the range of ideas and the perspectives. I really like the spirit uh, of, of cooperation. Um, you know, Scotty, as a, as a token American sitting on the thing, you, you did your country proud. Uh, you represented all the diversity of opinion in America brilliantly. Uh, we didn't gang up Johnny on you too badly. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was um, 
Uh, this was a wonderful it was a wonderful event. We brought you together to deal with questions of energy, of environment, and of infrastructure. You canvassed the field brilliantly for us across a whole range of things. You, you left us with more questions than answers, and I think that's exactly what we need in this process. Uh, describe the fact that it's so challenging. I really like the fact, if I can say one thing in the end, though, that each one of you in your own way made a really important point. This is one of the world's most successful partnerships. Scott, I'm going to choose your word. And, 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 and Gary, you talked about it as friendship and, and long-term collaboration. You know, yes, we have our points of irritation, but two countries get along, very few countries in the world get along as well as Canada and the United States. And JP mentioned this before when he talked about the, the thousands of points of contact, whether this is in tourism on the one hand and snowbirds on the other, whether it's a commercial relationships, massive investment decisions, we are integrated more fully and more substantially than we perhaps want to admit. But we're integrated because it works for both of us. It isn't a, a, a lopsided structure that sort of benefits America way more than Canada or vice versa. Um, you have done a tremendous job of bringing our audience to sort of a full understanding of the complexity of this very important relationship. And I think highlighted the fact that the next four years, not to sort of go back to your, your, your concluding comments, but the next four years are going to be tr tremendously intense, not just because of President Biden or Prime Minister Trudeau or whoever sort of fits into the various Congress and the House of Commons, but because these are troubled times globally. We still have a pandemic to go through and the, and the recovery to sort of build on. Um, we still have climate change to address in a systematic way. We haven't even talked about the role of China and the sort of geopolitical forces that are out there more generally. We have a thousand issues on the table. And quite frankly, when I look at this, even when I get irritated with Keystone XL and other things, I look back and say, we're really lucky to have America on our side in all of these issues and on these processes. And I really hope that America feels the same way. Uh, Canada is a great friend. We're a little bit too quiet sometimes, but I think this relationship is one of the most powerful in the world. So uh, JP, thank you very much. Lisa, you've been terrific. Gary, really appreciate you joining us today. Scotty, it's been wonderful. Uh, on behalf of the McDonald Laurie Institute and our, our webinar on building across borders, I thank you very, very much for your participation today. Bye everybody. Bye, Ken. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much.